I'd like to start by pointing out the banner above his head, the preamble of the Bill of Rights. And I focus on the preamble of the Bill of Rights time and time again because it's not taught in our schools. You won't find it in most of the constitutional textbooks, but it's part of the Constitution. And what it does is it tells us the purpose of the Bill of Rights. We don't have a Second Amendment right to own a weapon. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, tells us the Second Amendment prevents the federal government from passing any law that has to do with a weapon. The problem is we have allowed the federal government to overreach and pass laws, and we haven't challenged them. So without further ado, I'd like for the panel to introduce themselves, and, uh, and then we'll start with Christina asking come from the audience questions. I'm Paul T. Jansen. I'm with Let's Talk Spartanburg. I'm Bill Conley. I'm a teacher at Gaffney High School, U.S. History. Uh, I'm Christina Jeffrey, homemaker and uh, part-time teacher at Wofford. I teach government. Thanks. Christina, would you like to start? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I'm, I'm ready. Um, my question has to do with the HHS mandate and the, uh, the infringement on the religious liberties of all Americans. The, the uh, First Amendment to the Constitution passed almost immediately after the, the uh, first Congress assembled guarantees our religious freedoms. And the HHS mandate uh, violates an important tenet of the Catholic Church that goes back 2,000 years. It was one of the things that differentiated uh, Christians from pagans, our respect for life and for unborn life. What can be done about this? <coughs> Uh, well, we missed an opportunity in November, uh, but aside from that, um, I, I had uh, privilege may not be the right word, let's say opportunity uh, to have uh, Secretary uh, Sebelius come before one of our committees. And I asked uh, Secretary Sebelius because in her, uh, the promulgation of that rule, uh, which is part of the Affordable Care Act, uh, the promulgation of that rule said that she balanced uh, uh, medical needs with, with uh, religious liberty, which struck me as an interesting way of phrasing that because I wasn't aware that it was her prerogative to balance my right to religious liberty with anything. So I asked her about it, and if you haven't seen the YouTube, I would encourage you to go uh, watch to find. just how utterly unfamiliar she was with the Constitution. Um, it was, uh, it, 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 it would be sad if it weren't so pathetic and if she weren't going to stick around for the second uh, second term. Professor Jeffrey's question, I, I want to just give you a little bit of, of, of background. Um, there have been a number of Supreme Court cases where religious groups have challenged uh, rules, regulations, laws promulgated either by the federal government or by state governments. Uh, for instance, I think all of us would acknowledge that having an educated citizenry is a good thing. We want people who are educated. So when a state passes a law that you must stay in school until a certain age, in this case it was until the age of 14, a religious group objected because they didn't want their kids staying in school until age 14. They wanted them going until they were 12, and then they wanted them going to work on the farm. So the religious group objected. They sued in federal court, and guess who won? How about animal sacrifice? I've got three dogs, judge, jury, and bailiff. They're part of the That's their names. That's their names. I don't... I'm not a big fan of animal sacrifice. But there was a religious group in Florida. When Florida passed a statute outlawing animal sacrifice, a religious group protested and said it's part of our religious ceremony. So they challenged it. Guess who won? How about license tags? When the state wants to put a certain phrase on a license tag and the Jehovah's Witnesses objected to it, they sued. Guess who won? 
How about a Christian school that wanted to decide whether or not to hire or rather retain a teacher? They wanted to get rid of a teacher because a teacher did not was not a member of their faith. So they got rid of her and she sued and the name of the case is Hosanna Tabor and it went to the United States Supreme Court and the decision was nine to nothing that the government cannot tell religious schools which teachers to keep and not keep. So how in the world can they tell Notre Dame University or a company that happens to have been started and founded by a practicing Catholic that you have to offer contraception and abortifacients. How can you do that? We had a panel of bishops and others. If you're not familiar with the Beckett Fund, you ought to get familiar with it. They've done really good work on religious liberty. And you know what I think is going to happen, uh, Professor Jeffrey, is this is tangled up in the courts now. Hobby Lobby sued, other people have sued. My guess is that that tenet of faith to, to Catholics is so important that they will engage in civil disobedience before they will before they will follow it. And you know what? Those of us who are not Catholic ought to be right there beside them. Because tomorrow it will be something else that, that impacts Jewish believers or, or, or people of Jewish faith. It will be Baptist or Presbyterians. This is the time. Look, they promulgated this rule to perpetuate the myth that we had a war against women. They're losing the battle when it comes to abortion because of something called an ultrasound. They're losing the battle. So now they want to switch and have a conversation about contraception so they can that they can perpetuate this myth that we have a war on women. And in the process, they've happened to have stumbled upon your First Amendment right to religious liberty. We had a chance in November to stop it. We're going to have a chance in the courts to stop it. If we don't stop it in the courts, this country has a long tradition of civil disobedience, which I hope we will exercise before anyone allows the federal government to tell our Catholic brothers and sisters that you must violate your faith. So that's what I'm Next question, Bill, when you place the question, if you could use the microphone. Okay, I'm okay. loud enough. I'm sure they'll hear me, yeah. hear me in the back. Stand, stand up. up. Stand okay. up. I'll stand up. All right. In a follow-up to that question, the Tenth Amendment provides powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Following up on your question of nullification, <coughs> at what point? Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, authoring the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, and we've seen nullification. How far do you think we should take? How far, far do you think we will take this idea of nullification to uh, to, uh, to go forth on these on these ideas we're talking about here, and one of them being the Health Care Act? Well, nullification uh, has been debated in this country for a couple hundred years up to and including this afternoon when I uh, met with uh, four of my friends in Greenville and then had a conversation with my colleague Mick Mulvaney on that, this very point. I never remember studying it in law school, but there are lots of things I didn't study in law school that I probably should have. Here's the way I look at it. it, it if, if we, if Con I say we, if Congress promulgated uh, passed a law that said you must do X and X violated your deeply held religious conviction uh, you wouldn't do it so you would in essence nullify that the question is do you go from zero to 100 miles an hour or are there incremental stages along the way and I think um, and of course, it depends upon what 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 the the agreement is. If if it's um, well, take the Affordable Care Act, take Obamacare. 
we challenged the NFIB versus Sebelius, and South Carolina joined that case. And Alan Wilson did a wonderful job. And lest anybody in the audience forget, we won on two of the three counts. We, we won on the Commerce Clause, which is really important. We won on Medicaid, which is really important. We just lost on the tax and spend. So one of the ways to challenge a law that you don't agree with is to challenge the constitutionality of it. That's one of the incremental <coughs> stages. I think it may have been Federalist Paper 44, but uh, I stand to be corrected. They cited one of the remedies for uh, an overreaching federal government, replace the representatives that did what you found to be wrong, um, which is another form of nullification, not with a capital N. You have the doctrine of interposition. Uh, you also have civil disobedience. So it strikes me that, you know, if it's real ID, that was an example of nullification being successful. The last Supreme Court case that dealt with nullification, uh, and unless y'all are aware of one after it that I'm not aware of, um, emanated from, from, from Arkansas, uh, Aaron versus Cooper. And this dealt with the integration of schools. And Arkansas um, said that they were not going to inter integrate the schools, despite the fact that the, the federal government said you are. And so they went to the Supreme Court, and it was a unanimous decision. And the Supreme Court, using the Supremacy Clause, said, um, yes, you are. And Arkansas did. That's the last case on nullification that I'm aware of. There have been examples where it was successful with real ID. There are examples where it was not successful, Eric versus Cooper. I would, you know, if any of my friends in the state legislature ask, I, I would probably encourage them to take an incremental approach for this reason. I, I don't fully know what the practical ramifications of it will wind up being. I think there was a letter to the editor written by another Professor Jeffrey that said, unless you have an army, I don't know where you're going with it. Um, by the same token, we have witnessed, you know, the fact that you're asking me a question about nullification necessarily means something has already gone wrong. Either the state government has uh, found its way into something that was enumerated for the federal government to do, or the federal government has overstepped its limitations. I mean, it's the only way you get to this conversation. So it, it has some appeal to me that you correct it at the lowest level that you can correct it. And, and the ballot box would probably be the lowest level you can correct it. Uh, we haven't been terribly successful there. The other thing to keep in mind is, um, to harken back to equity, the equitable doctrine of unclean hands. Have we accepted any money from the federal government as a state um, that was outside the federal government's authority to spend. Do we have unclean hands? Um, did we stop it the very first time that there was a, there was an expansion beyond the, the enumerated powers, or did we just wink and nod until finally we said we we've, we've had enough? I wish Alan were here because when you challenge without getting into too much detail. When you challenge the constitutionality of a federal statute, which South Carolina did, then you're necessarily consenting, or one could argue, you're necessarily consenting that the federal court is going to be the arbiter of whether or not there was an overstep, or else you wouldn't have sued, right? So you went on two and you lose on one. To then go from that, which necessarily assumes that the federal court is the proper arbiter of what's constitutional and what's not, to then go from that in court, in the Supreme Court, I was there for the oral argument, to we don't like the result, so we're going to go to nullification, um, that's an interesting progress to take. Because at one hand, a year ago, you're consenting that the federal court is the proper decision maker. 
And now you're saying there's not. I, I will disagree with Marbury versus Madison from this standpoint. Marbury versus Madison, as you know, is where the Supreme Court said we are the final arbiter of what is constitutional and what is not. The Constitution begs to differ. The Constitution has given Congress in two different places the ability to limit the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. And the last thing I'll say about nullification, unless it's brought back up again, I think, to my knowledge, everybody just put their hand on the heart and pledged allegiance to the flag. And at least in my version, I use the word indivisible. What does the word mean? Just, uh, just a quick follow up. We see this, and it's pushed by the federal government immigration laws that they will not enforce. Worse, 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 just worse. A quick follow up. We see worse, worse, and it's pushed by the federal government immigration laws that they will not enforce. Worse, 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 and it is by the federal government immigration laws that we are not in full. Just a follow up. We see this. And it is by the federal government immigration laws that we are not in full. Just a quick follow up. We see this. And it is by the federal government immigration laws that we are not in full. Just quick follow up. We see this, and it by the Fed government laws that not enforced. Just quick follow up. We see this, and it by the Fed government laws that not enforced. Just quick follow up. We see this, and it by the Fed government laws that not enforced. Just quick follow up. We see this, and it by the Fed government laws that not enforced. Just quick follow up. We see this, and it by the Fed laws that not enforced.